Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Erica Wyman. I'm the Deputy Artistic Director at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Amongst other things, I have the great honour of being responsible for making sure we programme new plays, plays which treat of the human condition in the most imaginative and ambitious way possible, alongside plays written by Shakespeare and Shakespeare's contemporaries. And that's why I'm standing here. I was just saying to my colleague Tom Morton-Smith that if it weren't for him, there was absolutely no chance that I would be sitting at the front of a distinguished Royal Society audience about to talk about science. It's wonderful that we've been able to collaborate with the Royal Society to make this event happen tonight. There are, of course, as we're going to hear in the course of the evening, many brilliant experiments in drama that treat of the scientific world. Our excuse for this evening, however, is Tom's brilliant play, Oppenheimer. And to give a little tiny bit of context for that, and then I'll explain how the evening is going to work, we asked Tom to think big. So that, as I've just mentioned, we are at the Royal Shakespeare Company interested in plays that really allow us to think about the biggest and most complex and most difficult ideas. And I'm a real believer that the theatre, as well as being a place for entertainment and enjoyment, is also a place where you can explore and suggest the most complex of ideas. You don't need to explain them, you simply need to suggest them for people to be awoken to the possibilities. But that's a hell of a thing to say to a writer, and I will allow Tom to tell you more about what happened next, but my experience was that this wonderful play arrived that looked at an essential moment in the 20th century and how we read our world through that moment and how we think about leadership and how we think about love and all sorts of things that seem not to have very much to do with science, as well as allowing us a lens on what science meant then and how we might think about it now. And so it has provoked uh, an important question. Why might science be an interesting subject for the stage? When does that work? When does that take off? And when is that deadly? Uh, Oppenheimer, I'm pleased to say, had a wonderful run in Stratford and has now successfully transferred to the West End. So we are choosing to conclude that it has worked on this occasion. What's going to happen this evening is uh, our distinguished speakers, who I'll introduce briefly in just a moment, will each speak to you for about five minutes. I'm going to be absolutely ruthless. They're on theatre time tonight, so they've, they've got to speak for a short um, and mad maddeningly short amount of time so that we can have a discussion. And then we will have a, a more uh, informal discussion, the five of us, and then I will open up and make sure that you can ask us some questions. We're recording proceedings tonight, both for a webcast and for our archives. And for that reason, if for no other, can I ask you to make sure your mobile phones are switched off or turned to airplane mode? It's a very exciting idea. I have one more thing to tell you um, in terms of housekeeping, which is that we are not planning to evacuate you tonight. <laughs> and so if you do hear an alarm, this is our fire exit just to the right of the stage. Everyone's with me? Excellent. <clears throat> so, um, just before I introduce our panel, can I uh, have a very quick show of hands, as David Dimbleby always says. Can you put your hand in the air if it's primarily the theatre that's brought you here tonight? Marvellous. And can you put your hands in the air if it's primarily the world of science that has brought you here tonight? It's fantastic. I mean, I, I know it's never plausible when he says it on question time, but that does look about 50-50. Excellent. <laughs> um, and I'll be wanting to know, uh, particularly later, from those of you who couldn't decide which one it was. So, uh, it is a proper thrill to introduce uh, an extraordinary range of people to speak to you about this subject. Tom, I think, needs not much more introduction, and I'll let him talk to you a little bit about his journey to writing Oppenheimer. But let me tell you that I read a great number of plays, and this play had such certainty, which in the context of writing about science is perhaps a, an unusual thing to say. It had a real sense of what it wanted to describe about the world in a very complicated story. After Tom, we'll hear from Professor John Barrow. And some of you will know that John is a cosmologist. He's the Professor of Mathematical Sciences at Cambridge University. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society. He's the author of many books about science and mathematics for the general public. And he's the author of the award-winning play Infinities, which was directed by Luca Ronconi. After John, 
we'll hear from Dr. Kirsten Shepherd Barr. Uh, Kirsten is a scholar at Oxford University in the Faculty of English. She's written extensively about science on the stage, and I want to make sure to tell you the title of her latest book. Um, bear with me one second. Technology letting me down already? I don't know. <clears throat> Science on Stage was her earlier book, and uh, I'm going to tell you later about her other book. <laughs> and then, uh, last but in no sense least, I'm very proud to say that we're joined by Professor Marcus de Soto, OBE. He's the Professor of Mathematics, the Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University. But he is, of course, a brilliant storyteller and broadcaster about science and how science illuminates our world. So they're each going to speak to you, and then we will reconvene for a discussion. Thank you very much for coming. Hello. Uh, I'm Tom Morton-Smith. Uh, I'm a playwright. I wrote Oppenheimer, which has been put on by the RSC. It's currently on in the West End, which is very nice. Um, I was asked by the RSC to uh, pitch them the biggest idea I could think of. Um, I pitched them an eight-play play cycle on the history of physics in the 20th century. <laughs> they kind of laughed and went, ha, pick one. Um, so I uh, chose to write about Oppenheimer, specifically um, the building of the atomic bomb. Um, what I'd like to uh, talk to you tonight is it, is more about uh, the relationship between art in general and science, to start us off with. Um, I don't have a scientific background. My first introduction to physics was Tom Stoppard. Uh, what I have noticed, and what I think makes theatre and science such an interesting match, is the inherent theatricality of the lecture hall and the anatomy theatre. Um, the first play I wrote that touched on science um, which is languishing in the bottom of my hard drive somewhere, um, was about the Renaissance anatomist Andreas Vesalius. Um, he would tour Europe performing dissections in front of uh, huge audiences. He understood that a person's interest in science can be inflamed by theatre. The climax of his show would always be the removal of the heart, and he would hold it aloft above his head. Um, Michael Faraday's lecture, The Chemical History of the Candle, reads to me more like a play script than as a work of science. It's a, it's, about, it's a piece about communication. It's about bringing scientific ideas into the realm of public discourse. And that's what the best um, combination of science and theatre can do. Every so often, whenever the arts are threatened with further government cuts, Winston Churchill starts trending on my Twitter timeline. Everyone knows the quote by now. Asked whether the arts should be cut to fund the war effort, he responds with the snappy, then what are we fighting for? Only he never said that. Um, it sounds about right, uh, but you would have an easier job ascribing it to the American physicist Robert Wilson. Uh, questioned before Congress's Joint Committee on Atomic Energy um, about the value of building a new particle accelerator, Wilson responded that it had no value in terms of security, defence or military application. Since the Manhattan Project, it had become quite normalised to discuss scientific funding in the same breath as weapons development. Wilson spoke against the tide. The scientific knowledge brought about by this new accelerator, Wilson placed alongside art, sculpture and poetry. Uh, the direct quote is, it has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of man, our love of culture. It has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptures, great poets? I mean, all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending our country except to make it worth defending. Wilson was a scientist who appreciated art. His sculpture is dotted around the grounds of Fermi Lab, where he was director. His influence in the lab's architect architecture is strongly apparent. He understood the power of art to communicate complex thoughts, to symbolically represent an idea rather than prove it. Uh, Wilson was not alone amongst, um, amongst Manhattan Project scientists who understood the value of art. Uh, Richard Feynman, as well as being a bongo player, uh, was an accomplished artist whose passion for drawing came from a desire to communicate scientific awe. Robert Oppenheimer's brother, Frank, uncle of the atomic bomb, um, understood the common role of scientist and artist. Um, he often said that they were the noticers of society, um, who, without whom stars would remain blobs in the sky and human faces would remain a mystery. Without science to explain and art to interpret, 
then we would know nothing and nothing would be done. Frank Oppenheimer was a great scientific communicator. His Exploratorium in San Francisco has become a template for science museums across the globe, combining science, art and education in a way that excites and inspires. Art that engages with science or chooses to explore scientific themes and understanding can be, best, can be understood in terms of Wittgenstein's ladder. That is, it is the lie that shows the way to truth. Plays such as Michael Frayn's Copenhagen, My Oppenheimer, or Complicite's A Disappearing Number are not truth. They are not documentary. What they do is introduce a scientific figure or a scientific idea, tether it to the structure of story and drama, and introduce an otherwise unknown aspect of history to a new audience. The same can be said for the recent films inspired by the lives of uh, Stephen Hawking and Alan Turing. Um, the science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov, said that science fiction is the branch of literature that deals with the responses of human beings to changes in science and technology. It is, the, it is how new scientific ideas disseminate amongst the populace. And that holds true, I think, for science in fiction as well. Whether we're talking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Electricity, H.G. Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau and Vivisection, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park and DNA, it also holds with Frayn's Copenhagen, Brecht's The Life of Galileo, Duran Matt's The Physicists, Carol Chapek's Rossum's Universal Robots. This is how non-scientists talk about science. Art, and especially theatre, can be a gateway to science, and it should be. Thank you. We're very grateful uh, to our last speaker for creating the context uh, to have this discussion. Went to see his play last week. If you haven't seen it, I recommend that you go and see it. You've not got very long to see it. My own connection with the theatre and science dates back to 1999, when I was asked to, first of all, convene and chair a discussion at the Spoleto Arts Festival, the Due Monde Festival in Spoleto in the summer. And the different participants we had chosen had experience at presenting science in different media. And so the event was called The Expression of Science. And there were some playwrights like Carl Gerassi, there were uh, fiction writers like Ian McEwan, um, and people from even the world of, of opera, journalists, novelists, about half a dozen people. And in chairing this, I also had to talk a little about uh, the theatre and things that might be done and hadn't been done so far. And what stirred me at that time was the fact that there were very successful uh, applications or introductions of science in the theatre, like Frayn's Copenhagen or uh, Brecht's Galileo, which were being talked about as though they were plays about science, or really they weren't at all. They were human dramas that happened to involve scientists or confronted issues, historical issues, uh, in which science played a part. And they were exciting and they were successful uh, because of that content. But I had wondered whether it was possible to create a play which was actually about scientific ideas primarily, rather than about scientists, and talked a little about that. And then afterwards, Luca Ronconi and some of his assistants who took part in the discussion uh, approached the sponsors and asked whether it was possible to invite me to prepare something, to write something in that style, because it turned out that Ronconi was interested in such an approach as well. And so what happened uh, over the next year was that I wrote a play called Infinities, which attempted to present something on stage which was about mathematical ideas, not about mathematicians. So there was no particular psychological drama, no characterization that played any key role. But the style was to create five stories, five scenarios, each of which based upon some type of paradoxical or challenging uh, problem, paradox from mathematics and the infinite, in which the audience find themselves immersed, and so the paradox becomes as large as life. Well, what happened 
then, well, what, why was the subject infinities chosen? This is an abstract and rather transcendental notion. But nonetheless, if you stop people on the street and ask them about the infinite or what they think about the infinite, what they feel about it, uh, it doesn't seem that mysterious or bizarre to them. It's not like asking about sheaf cohomology uh, or string theory or Calabi Yau manifolds. Uh, everyone feels that they have a little bit of a feeling for the infinite, whether it's because of religious beliefs or watching science fiction movies or Star Wars or something. So people feel they have a way in, there's uh, something appealing about it. And so what was then done with interaction with Ronconi using a rather particular space was to write five stories, uh, each largely independent of the others. And the way things were staged was that the first had a fraction of the audience come to watch it, and then they moved around to another space next door and watched the second story while another audience arrived and watched the first, and so on, until eventually all five scenes were being watched simultaneously by different audiences. And it took about 100 minutes, and uh, in one evening in Milan, this might be done 10 times to meet all the people uh, that wanted to come and see it. So I think Kirsten has a few pictures to show about from some of these productions. What were the stories? What was the idea? <clears throat> well, the first scenario uh, was a welcome to the Hotel Infinity, something that mathematicians will recognize, uh, an infinite hotel. And the way that dealing with an infinite hotel and its guests is quite different from the problem of a finite hotel. Even if it's full, you can always accommodate more guests. Even if an infinite number of prospective guests guests turn up, you can still accommodate them. So many elaborations and sidetracks uh, created a story which uh, sort of uh, revolved around the goings-on in the entrance hall uh, to this hotel. But in a stupendous set, uh, which went up story after story after story in the sky, it was the place where the scenery had been constructed for La Scala uh, on walkways that went roundabout. So you really could sound the clarion in the morning and have 400 people appear from their doors reading copies of the Times. The second scene was rather different in a space that's low like this, and it was more sociological, more personal. It was about living forever and the paradoxes of living forever. And it was set in an old people's home in the far, far future, where people complained uh, and wondered about the problems that were arising because you were living forever, whether it was insurance policies, how much compensation you might bring if you accidentally brought someone's life to an end, what were the disadvantages of living in a world where there seemed to be enough time to do anything. So some people were manically active, spending all their time trying to do everything they ever wanted to do. But there were other people that thought there was time enough for anything. And so the world was full of unfinished projects. So I said that you might want to describe it by a word like manana, but which doesn't convey the same sense of urgency. So uh, that was the second scene. The third was a world where nothing was original. So this is the infinite replication paradox, where there's a finite chance of anything happening, in an infinite number of choices, then everything will eventually happen, infinitely often. And so nothing you've ever thought of, nothing you've ever invented, can be original. It's always been thought of before. And this again was in an unusual set, a vast matrix, uh, with mirrors along the walls, uh, with actors uh, repeating exact words from different places at exactly the same moments to convey this idea. But then occasionally there would be things that could happen that were supposed to be unique. One of the ancient objections by Augustine to this infinite replication paradox was that it was in conflict with uh, Christianity because it would require uh, the incarnation to have occurred on every world in an infinite universe. So he used this as an argument against the infinite universe. Whereas during the American Revolution, Thomas Paine turned the argument around 
He said, because it's so self-evident that the universe is infinite, and so there must be life and replication everywhere, uh, it could not possibly the, be the case the incarnation has occurred uh, everywhere on this infinity of worlds. So it can't be true. The fourth scene was about Cantor, really in a mental hospital. Cantor, one of the originators of the most original conception of infinity in mathematics. But someone who struggled with huge opposition again from other mathematicians who felt that he was undermining the entire logic of mathematics by introducing falsehoods and contradictions which would cause it to fall. So for a long period he withdrew himself from the world of mathematics and worked on the history of mathematics and developed his talents as an artist. So it's very much about that whole scenario and sequence of events. The last scene uh, is about where the play came from and it's about time travel. So that if uh, I were to travel uh, you were to travel forwards in time and watch this play uh, and learn about it from me uh, and then travel backwards in time and write about it, I might read your book about it and learn about it there. So where has the play come from in this cyclic picture of time? So these are just five little summaries of this play with its unusual settings. I think it did many things that had not been done in the theatre before, thanks to Ronconi's brilliance. Uh, and that of the actors who had an extraordinarily challenging uh, assignment uh, to sort of staff this constantly cyclic and repeated uh, theatrical performance uh, in one evening. Every scene when it was performed was very, very slightly different. And so the whole idea of infinite replication, repeatability, interwoven into the style of the performance and the mingling of the audience uh, with the actors and the sets. So this just illustrates a different way of doing science in theatre, not didactically particularly, not focusing on scientists as human beings or ethical problems, but attempting to represent scientific ideas in a new way, and in this case, mathematical ideas. Something that's common in representations of science fiction, as Tom mentioned, you don't see much science fiction in the theatre. It's in the cinema, it's on paper in print, but not very often in the theatre. Thank you. It seems only right that I should introduce Dr. Shepard Barr properly. Um, so to complete my earlier introduction, her most recent book, which you can have a good look at as you go out, and has just been published, is called Theatre and Evolution from Ibsen to Beckett. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that um, filling in the gap. <laughs> um, Thank you very much for inviting me to speak here um, on this distinguished panel. And I have to declare, it's such an honor, but I'm the odd one out because I'm the only one, apart from Erica, who hasn't written a science play. Um, at least you've been involved in producing them. So, um, And I believe that, that uh, all but John Barrows have been produced in this country. So I'm going to show a few slides from his play so you can at least get a, a sense of what um, what it was like, because it was extraordinary. My slides are few, but they give a sense of the great diversity in theatrical engagements with science and the radically different approaches we see. And it really is extraordinary. And that's kind of the th thing I'd like to emphasize is the sky's the limit. This is uh, a sense of one kind of science play. Um, and I wonder if anyone re recognizes that setting. Anyone visited Charles Darwin's house, Down House uh, in Kent? OK, hand at the back. <laughs> um, that was from Peter Parnell's play, Trumpery, which is about, that was 2009, um, the moment, really, when Darwin uh, received the paper by Wallace. And it traces that um, history. So it's very faithful. It's very lovingly recreated. Uh, and then you have, at the opposite extreme, a play we've talked about already, uh, mentioned, which is Michael Frayn's Copenhagen. 
uh, a bare stage and a couple of chairs, really. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. But if you fix those images in your mind, you really get a sense of uh, quite, quite different approaches. But every play, every science play, sorry, faces similar challenges. One is the how, how to represent it, how to avoid being dull or didactic or lecturing the audience, and also whether or not you're being accurate. This is surely one of the most contentious issues. So getting the science right, uh, this is, this is a, a, a fundamental issue in the representation of science on stage, and there are very different uh, beliefs about that. And we may well get to this in the panel discussion. There's also the problem of time. So some scientific processes take a very long time, like evolution. Uh, how do you portray that in two hours traffic on the stage? But also the problem of scale, depicting what in science might be far too small, for example, nuclear fission, or too big, so climate change or cosmic processes. So there are those challenges. Though plays usually tell a story, and that's common to science as well, science tells stories too, they, they normally don't have a narrator. So they rely instead on other mechanisms like character, dialogue, scenic elements, and above all, metaphor, whereby the science is used to express and explain something fundamental about human behavior. So the uncertainty principle in Frayn's play, for example, or the likening of people to elements from the periodic table in the play Oppenheimer. There's a lovely way in which Oppenheimer says, I need to be iron. And then that uh, becomes, you'll have to help me out here. <laughs> he says, I become a core of cold iron. And then he becomes tungsten and lead, I guess. So, um, so he, he traces that throughout the second act of the play, that development, that metaphor. There are certain material conditions of theater that make it unique. So this is often seen as a limitation, what for some people is a drawback or constraint. So the stage being physically limited. You're limited in what you can do compared to, say, cinema. Um, for others, that's precisely the advantage that theater has. The part can gesture towards the whole. You can suggest, you can leave the rest to the audience's imagination. But really the key is the theater's liveness and immediacy. You have a direct confrontation with new ideas, a shared experience in real time, learning together over time, as well as mutually constituting meaning from what the audience is watching. And this all contributes to an epistemological process and I certainly felt this when watching Marcus de Sotoy's X and Y at the Science Museum and Complicité is a Disappearing Number a few years ago. So it's not actually so much about re-presenting the science, simply showing it again, than about creating something new from the audience's encounter with it. So this often comes through a merging of form and content. Part of Copenhagen's success was due to the ingenious way in which the play enacted its ideas. The original director, Michael Blakemore, explained that, quote, if we had the actors moving rather like particles within an atom, there would be times when this could be instructive and other times when, as a metaphor, it might be quite interesting. And so you see they are circling all the time and you can circle infinitely <laughs> on a stage. But there's also some rebellion against the Copenhagen model because of its use of mediation. So the reliance on mechanisms like biography, history, and metaphor to convey the science. As one director puts it, we don't have to do night school. Several recent productions inventively stage science without the use of a single author's script, but through collaboration between directors, scientists, and sometimes the actors too. Here's infinities. I'm showing you some pictures of this, not necessarily linking it to this uh, movement in such an extreme manner as Jean-François Jean Perret, who's had, had that to say about uh, Copenhagen. But as an example of, of a collaboration between scientist and director that John has just uh, talked about. Uh, and Ronconi, so the idea is to, quote, throw the science at the audience and see what sticks in Ronconi's words. Throw the science at the audience. Um, and this is what they did in those thought experiments that they staged that John's just described. 
Their production involved the audience in an immersive experience as they moved from scene to scene in that extraordinary space that evoked the concept of infinity in different ways, so enacting the ideas. In such devised, site-specific theater, the text becomes only one of many elements, all treated with equal weight. The text doesn't take some prime position, but it's part of a de-hierarchization of theatrical means. The risk, of course, and you're getting a sense of these different spaces, I hope, here. Um, the risk, of course, is that you're not sure what the audience will get. How much of the science will they understand, or does that even matter? But here's the unmediated bit. The science is the character or, pl and, or plot. Uh, you're throwing the science at the audience. Great. So there is a seemingly infinite number of approaches to representing science, and the material confines of the stage don't seem like limitations at all, but constantly open up new possibilities. Thank you. Uh, mathematics and theatre have always been part of my life, but actually when I was a student, um, the theatre was where I ran away from my mathematics. So you spend mathematics, you spend a lot of time on your own in your off office just thinking away, and I needed something somewhere to run away and play with people. So for me, actually, theatre was the thing I did when I didn't do my mathematics. Um, uh, and I used to go to a, a, um, a uh, community theatre at Pegasus Theatre in Oxford um, and it was there that I actually uh, came in contact with Complicite for the first time. They were still quite a young company and they came and did workshops for the community. Um, and actually when my maths was going really badly and I thought I was going to have to give up, I, the number of times I've downloaded um, the application form for the Lecoq Theatre in Paris, which is where all Complicite went through, but uh, uh, despite having a very French surname, it was always the fact that it was all taught in French that kind of uh, worried me a little bit. But, um, uh, but so, so actually it was rather weird because theatre and maths are actually two very different parts of my life. Um, uh, and then a, a few years ago I got this email from Complicite and they said we're a theatre company, you probably haven't heard of us and um, uh, we'd like you to come in because we're doing a project about maths. Um, and uh, they still have kept the email that I w sent back because it was so euphoric and oh, I've always wanted to run away with you and, uh, um, uh, uh, and so, so I got this chance to go in and actually explore uh, actually why I love both of these worlds, the world of theatre and the world of mathematics. Um, and they were working on this play which was looking at the collaboration between uh, G.H. Hardy, a Cambridge mathematician, and Ramanujan, an Indian mathematician, or already wonderful drama, East meets West. And they based um, the, their kind of uh, exploration on this wonderful book called A Mathematician's Apology, which is actually one of the books my uh, teacher in my comprehensive school had recommended to me, which made me fall in love with mathematics. Um, and in this book, uh, uh, the, actually the introduction is um, the story of Ramanujan and Hardy, written by C.P. Snow. Um, but inside is the description of how the creative act of doing mathematics. Now, uh, Simon McBurney was very keen that this play, rather as John Barrow has indicated, should not just be about these curious characters, G.H. Hardy and Ramanujan, but should have, rather like Copenhagen did, have the mathematics embedded in the structure of the play. He really wanted to express the mathematics that excited these two mathematicians. Um, and so he got me in to do um, uh, some workshops uh, exploring mathematics, and because I love theatre, I found some ways to, to play games with the actors and actresses um, to, to give them a feel for the mathematics. And I thought a bit later, maybe I could show you one of these experiments that I did with the uh, actors, um, uh, which helped them to understand the idea of partition functions, which was one of the things that they collaborated on. Um, but it was doing these uh, uh, sort of games with them that I realised there's a very strong connection between these two worlds, because um, setting up experiments uh, uh, and seeing how they run, and sometimes they will fail and produce nothing uh, theatrical, uh, complicity work in a very devised 
his manner. There is no playwright. Uh, the play emerges from this playing. Um, but the connection I really found was the idea of pattern. And G.H. Hardy talks about this in a Mathematician's Apology. He says, a mathematician, like a painter or a poet, is a maker of patterns. I'm interested in mathematics only as a creative art. And I think practitioners of the theatre also love looking for pattern within the structure and narrative, but also on the geometry of the stage. And here's um, Peter Brook talking about the idea of pattern. Uh, this is one of my Desert Island books, um, uh, at the Empty Space. A most powerful explanation of the various arts is that they talk of patterns which we can only begin to recognise when they manifest themselves as rhythms or shapes. But I think there's something very particular about the theatre as an art form which has connections with mathematics. Because it's a very sort of abstract space where you can set up quite uh, surreal worlds. And that, for me, is the excitement of this. You, I want to explore theatre that doesn't translate to film or to, to a novel. And that, I think, is what um, uh, actually inspired me on my project, which grew out of my work with Complicité, to write my own play, which I devised. I mean, I, I'd say, again, it's not clear who wrote this play. Um, X and Y, I, I devised it with one of the actresses that I met there, um, uh, t uh, Victoria Gould, um, uh, which tried to sort of embed an, an interesting idea of mathematics in the, in the structures of the play. And I think this is the idea, because, again, Peter Brook here is talking many audiences will answer that they have seen the face of the invisible through the experience on the stage that transcend their experience in life. And for me, that's what mathematics is about. It's something transcendental. It's about creating a world that it isn't the physical world around us. That's the excitement of doing mathematics as opposed to science. Science is stuck with this kind of world here, but I can imagine anything. Um, and so I was very keen to explore the idea of a four-dimensional space and whether the stage could express the idea of a four-dimensional space. So this, I'm going to show you a little animation, which is actually um, the surface of a four-dimensional torus. Um, uh, and this is um, uh, it's kind of like a three-dimensional version of the game of asteroids. But actually, oh, let's um, take this back here. Um, let's see. Oh. I will get this to work. No, I won't. There we go. Excellent. So this could be our universe here, and the stage could be our universe. It's, uh, that is, and the universe might be actually not infinite, but finite. But how can it be finite without any boundaries? We're not living in the Truman Show. Well, the one idea is that you could go out this side and come in this side. Or you could go out the top of the stage and come in through the bottom of the stage. Or you could go um, out the front and come in at the back. And so my idea was this is actually a description of a surface of a four-dimensional um, torus. And so my idea was to use the fact that the stage and the theatre can express a mathematical concept that transcends anything you can see. Um, and, and so this became the inspiration for the space that our two actors... Um, I went a little bit further than John. I actually wrote a play which I could perform in. So uh, I, I play X and uh, Victoria played Y. Um, but the idea, I think, also for me, um, something that's very important is that mathematics and science and theatre is about storytelling and it has narrative running through it. Um, and so it's very important for me that this space not just be a didactic thing, but there be, you care about these characters and their motion through this space. So in some ways, I have managed to find my way uh, to run away with a theatre company, which is to write your own play. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you. How very fascinating, stimulating and provocative. I suppose the odd thing about a night like this is it would be easy to conclude that it's just a very good idea and we should do plays only about science. Um, so I suppose I want to ask the panel to kick us off. Um, wh when shouldn't we put science on stage? Wh when is it indeed deadly or a terrible idea? I is there such a thing? I mean, uh, uh, speaking to our Scientist colleagues, I'm sure you, the more the merrier, it must be part of your answer, but when, does it, when is it not a very good idea? 
Well, I, I personally don't think there should be any limit on. Uh, I think that would be crazy to set a limit. I think that you know, if, if you say there is something that shouldn't be, that that's like a you know a red rag to a, a you know. I'd be very happy to explore that because I think um, uh, I, I don't see why there should be any limit. For me, what um, is always the the cautionary tale is, and I think you see this in things like films like the Turing and the um, uh, Theory of Everything, is is when. You, you actually shy away from the, the science and, and, and it just becomes about the scientists. I think, for example, David Alban's um, play Proof did that. It's about mathematicians, it's about a proof, and, and you're just gagging to hear what the proof is and what is it about, and you never get that. And for me, that's deeply frustrating. <laughs> yeah, well, wait, well, Maybe it's just me. I don't no, know. <laughs> I'm sure it's not just you, but it is a very interesting dilemma in the theatre about being ner nervous. And I've heard, heard many people uh, talk about this in relation to different plays, being very nervous that the science will turn the audience off. They won't be able to follow it. They're not gagging for the proof. They just want to know what happens to the love story, whatever it might be. So I want to ask Tom, for those people who've not seen Oppenheimer, how you approached some, some of these thoughts that I think um, our colleagues have raised that are very vivid in the play, about pattern, for instance, about the notion of the science structuring, in a sense, the other stories in the play and other influences on Oppenheimer that you found useful. Yeah, um, I think... Uh when I uh, started, I mean, I was never very good at science at school. I was, I was terrible at maths. I was terrible at science. Um, I was very much um, off doing art and drama and media studies and English and those sort of things. Um, and it was only kind of... Uh, I couldn't spell, so that's... <laughs> <what's> <laughs> I still can't. I, so, um, the, uh, so when I kind of started in my 20s getting interested in science, and that was through um, watching documentaries on BBC4, um, some of which are very good. Bless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and there was a particular one that was um, that, that was hosted by um, uh, E, who was the lead singer of the Eels, oh, yes. and his father was Hugh Everett the Third, who was um, came up with the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, and um, and it followed E, who knew nothing about science, and it kind of introduced him to. Um, to the double slit experiment and um, parallel worlds and interference patterns and those sort of things. And, and this was fascinating mm, to me. Mm. And the fact that it was tethered to the um, relationship of a father and a son made it more accessible to me. Mm. And when I um, started researching um, uh, this, this play, when I started uh, reading all the biographies of Oppenheimer and the various people involved, um, that I was alongside reading the biographies. Every time they kind of talked about the science, I would then go out onto the internet and kind of find what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have the, um, if I couldn't tether the, the science to the story, to the discover, discovering of it, then it was more difficult for me to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why um, there's, a, there's a speech in the play where um, Robert Oppenheimer's wife, Kitty, um, says, uh, let me um, talk, I don't understand everything you do, but let me talk about what radiation is. And that's, mm -hmm. it's a form of expulsion. It's, it's, um, it's an atom losing parts of itself in order to become more stable. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially what I was trying to do with the character of Robert Oppenheimer, because he was losing, he was cutting off um, friends and family and beliefs and parts of himself so that he could become more stable and, and better equipped to, um, to continue with his work. So that's by humanizing, uh, by finding a way into the science <coughs> through the human stories of the people who discover it, dis discovered it or finding some sort of emotional um, metaphor or resonance in the science, that's, that's how I um, found my way to understand it. And if I, as a lay person at the beginning of writing it, if those were the things that interested me, if those were the things mm -hmm. that, yeah. um, that, that uh, opened up the science for me, then I put it on stage, because yeah. that would work for, for the audience um, who might know as little as I did when I started. So. <laughs> I, I, I should say, again, for people who haven't seen it, that there's something which you, know, you, you, you touched on, I think, which is in the play, which is about the uh, uh, kind of overwhelming enthusiasm for science. In, in particularly the young scientists, this kind of wonderful kind of playfulness and eagerness. So it seems to me that all well, versions of the human story, but there's a sense in which the play advocates for science, <laughs> whilst also cautioning us, of course, about it, some of its consequences. But I, I wanted to ask you, John, so you talk about 
in a way, trying to move away from this character-led exploration of science. Do, do you think as simple as that is it about, because actually as I was hearing you talk about the different episodes in Infinities, there are lots of human stories. Is it in fact about always wedding the science to the humanity, to the, to the human drama of, the, of what has happened to the... Not particularly. I mean, you might have noticed, as in many Ronconi plays, all the characters wear masks. They wear these white masks. So they all look the same. Um, but <clears throat> I wasn't trying to sort of draw the whole subject off in that particular direction. You know, if you went back to your question about what should you not do, yes. you know, what, what will be a bad thing to do? And I think a bad thing to do in the theatre would be just something that's not original, <laughs> okay, as typified by the cinema world, you know, where you do the same thing again, mm. you know, son of Frankenstein, grandson of Frankenstein, <laughs> you know, yeah. another film about Turing, uh, you know, another theory, two films about Hawking in a year. You know, you, you've got to think of something new. You've got, got to be original. This is one of the things in science and in mathematics that's actually always driving you, mm -hmm. you know, that if there's a good book or there's a good film, that's not a good enough reason to make a play. You know, so, so I think there's room for, you know, for a huge number of different types of new exploration. Mm -hmm. If it's new and it's original and it's doing something that's not been done before, um, then there are some of those things that can be done more brilliantly in the theatre where you've got this immediate yes. contact with, with the audience yeah. and the audience has got to be there. You know, and if you're not there, you know, you're going to miss it. You know, you're not, not going to have that experience mm, of yeah. John Heffernan on stage for nearly three hours, you know, <laughs> engaging with it. Uh, so it's, it's completely different. Something so it's why I don't like the telly, but I yeah. do like the, the theatre. Yeah. Um, and if you're a, you know, a scientist, university lecturer, you are in the theatre mode. You know, you lecture and you perform and you talk to people. Uh, you don't like talking to a camera in the corner, you know, unless you're Marcus or something. You know. <laughs> well, I, I, imagine, um, uh, I imagine the audience sitting on that. You have yeah. to do that. And that's, that's the art of making television, is to make it... The but it's, it, it's not theatre. They have to, yeah, to calm me down uh, on the yeah. <laughs> in front of the camera. But it's, it's about different. talking to somebody on the, the, uh, the sofa who's watching that, and you've got mm. to think of that person. So it's, it's still about um, uh, performance and connection. Yeah. Well, I was so struck by your description of in a way, a form of infinity, the sense of abstraction in mathematics being so linked to the possibilities of theatre. And, and in a way, the, the limitations of cinema and television, you know, they are in some sort of box as opposed to I think it boxes you in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So why, is that, why isn't there more theatre about mathematics? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> why isn't there more? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I think it is... Um, there's an interesting... Uh, it's a dilemma, I think, because you, you do want narrative drive, uh, and it's, it's, it's finding the balance, I yes. think, between um, uh, being boxed in by the, the, the just talking about the maths or about actually caring about the people. And I think that's why sort of biography is a very good way uh, of exploring that. But I think biography also can box you in. That, yes. That's why um, it's certainly complicity with the disappearing number. They had to cre create a, a parallel um, world, which is so, uh, because these people were just too known in a way. Yeah. They, so the parallel world is where they sort of explored the emotional world with this um, female mathematician. Um, uh, she was the one who explored the emotional world of the Hardy Romanogen kind of uh, love story. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so I think that, that's, that, that is kind of the challenge, that balance. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was going to say that the, um, the discussion has touched on the idea of what you don't do. And it's as if Brecht, when he wrote Life of Galileo, was maybe thinking something along those lines. Because if you remember, he doesn't show you the courtroom scene. He just, he, he avoids that. And it's part of his larger aesthetic agenda, <coughs> epic theater. But it's also not, not giving in to an audience's expectations of what the, the height of the drama is, which is the moment when shown the instruments, he will, he will give in. But then under his breath say, and yet it moves. Um, and so instead of that, you get the students waiting outside for the signal of whether he has given in or not. And you get their reaction. And everything focuses on them. And it's not at all about the big scientist at the center, the famous um, figure. So it's looking at it from a different angle is, is always incredibly productive, I think, in, mm. in the way theater and science engage each other. And would you say a little more about accuracy? 
because as a theatre director, I know that it is occasionally tempting. It has not happened at all in the Oppenheimer rehearsal room. <laughs> I'm sure it is occasionally tempting to suggest that something other than the accurate science might be more dramatic, more yeah. useful to that narrative drive. How do we navigate that? How important is it? It depends who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm sure this audience will have many different feelings about this, and it's a minefield. Um, because it depends, I think a large part of it, you can't make a blanket statement, I think, because, um, or maybe, maybe you'll feel that you can, but um, it depends on what kind of science you're engaging with. Yes. Um, it, it depends on, on, on repercussions. I mean, Tom's play is dealing with the actual historical events that came out of the science. and. Uh, and it deals with it really movingly and brings forth, there's one speech about the ambivalence that is just so, it just nails it. Um, so there isn't, there's, there's no easy solution, hmm. but you could say that, that one of the things that comes up again and again is does the playwright have a responsibility to be accurate when it's something like um, physics that then generates discoveries that then generate weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, or, in John's case, if it's a play that's about thought experiments that are, it's abstract by its nature, it's not going to be implemented, the science is, is to be thought about and to be encountered, but it hasn't got a historical, necessarily historical mm -hmm. component. Mm -hmm. Does it differ in, in that respect? Can you make a blanket uh, kind of rule? Mm -hmm. yes. John, I've interested in your views. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't matter. I mean, seeing Dave Walker, who I'm sure advised on the accuracy of some of the equations on those blackboards. It didn't actually matter if some of the equations were not quite right. But if they all were, though, so. <laughs> yeah, I, somebody wrote something that wasn't quite right in their haste when I watched. But if Tom Stoppard had messed up, you know, if Tom Stoppard had got the whole idea of chaotic sensitivity wrong in Arcadia, you know, that would have been a disaster. Mm. Um, there's another way in which people work with some of these ideas where you can sort of marry accuracy with exaggeration quite effectively. You know, the television series Numbers, which is quite fun. You've probably seen, you know, about mathematicians helping the police solve all sorts of crimes using usually some quite fancy mathematics. The mathematics is always right. It's all right. But the accuracy with which its results can be realised is totally exaggerated. You cannot find the drug dealer by using minimal spanning tree analysis. You know, the errors are far too large. And that's what the exaggeration is, to ignore the uncertainties uh, that get the mathematics right. Um, so there is a way of playing this game systematically, you know, so that you, you, you get all the nice things used, but you just ignore the fact that you know, it would never work in practice because the errors and the uncertainties would be too great and would overwhelm the strong result. Uh, you've uh, raised an interesting <laughs> word there. I want to ask Marcus about it, that uncertainty is surely something that the stage and certain branches of science, for instance, mathematics, truly share. And it's something that we're often, uh, I think, very anxious about, both on stage, certainly on screen and film. But in our culture, we're anxious about uncertainty, not quite sure how to capture it or speak about it, constantly trying to say it's this or it's this. Yes, Do I mean, I think that's one that? of the useful things uh, because uh, there's this perception that scientists are, have certainty yes. and that we know it all and, and we're, uh, we're often asked to give the answer and we have to say, uh, oh, we're not sure, and then that gets leapt on and, yes. and, and suddenly, oh, climate change doesn't exist because they, they're mm. being a little bit um, equivocal. And I think that's why, you know, it's why the theatre can be very useful to promote a, 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 uh, a lot of things about science, scientific ideas, but also the process of science mm. and that uncertainty. But actually, there's another element to this, which I think, you know, for, for me as a mathematician, actually, um, uh, there, there's a big difference between sort of art and what I do as a mathematics, which is the idea of ambiguity. Mm. For me, um, ambiguity is anathema. I mean, I, I want my proof it has to be very clear, and I, everybody who follows it should reach the same conclusion. Mm. Um, but actually, you don't want that about a piece of art. You want to leave a lot of room for. I mean, I don't mind if people have new ideas off the back of my mathematics, but I think that's an interesting uh, sort of uh, conflict that I've found that um, uh, that a, a playwright will often want to leave a lot of room for interpretation and different um, uh, people. I mean, I think that's 
why you know Curious Incident, uh, The Dog in the Nighttime, works as a book because it's so open. You you fill your own self in there, and uh, you know I, I actually was the advisor for the maths of the play because they they wanted to reproduce. Um, uh, Christopher's A-level solution, which is the appendix to the um, the book. Yeah. So, so I went in and worked a lot with um, the the actors. So uh, you can stay for the. I don't know if everyone's anyone's been to Curious Incident. Did you stay for the appendix? Because that was the bit I did. But um, <laughs> uh, but but, but what's, what's always curious to me is that the people, the actors who play the mathematicians, are always the ones who are most math phobic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. uh, Saskia yeah. Reeves, yeah. she was like, oh, you know, I would have to go in and sort of, but, but because they're so great, uh, you know, she, she went and she sat in seminars in Warwick and in Oxford and London, and she just picked <laughs> and absorbed enough such that you, people just thought she was a mathematician. Mm. But, but it's yes, the same with yes. Curious Incident. <laughs> uh, um, it's very interesting that I recognise that, I must say, that some of the most gifted actors w w will casually say, I was terrible at maths as, as a kind of, co I mean, Tom and Dalton is obviously not true in Tom's case. You know, we thought but, but, of... But it's not universal. There are some who just really get it. I mean, the games I played with Curious Innocent, there's some of the actors were just, just you know, loving mm, these mm, plays. and mm. say, Oh, yeah, I get that algebraic equation mm. that we did kind of with people. And uh, um, But there's a kind of real split. And, and, and I wonder if that relates to that question about ambiguity. And that there's something, if one has a bad experience of mass, a bit like if one has a bad experience of Shakespeare early in life, but it can be very scarring, and you know you find your you find your track. It might you know if it's an artistic track, there's something about exploring the constant set of possibilities. Do you recognise that either in your cast or in your play? That's that balance and relationship between certainty, uncertainty, ambiguity, and clarity. Yeah, I think um, I think I, I certainly um, wanted to, you know not coming from a scientific background really wanted to make sure that all of the science in the play was correct yeah. because that was very important to me. Um, it's not complete because you can't uh, give an audience uh, uh, you know, a, a full education in nuclear physics in three hours. Um, so I kind of had to choose which was important to propel the, the plot forward. Mm. Um, there's a, there was a, when we were cutting during the rehearsal period, there was a big section about um, the amount of empty space in an atom. That line was very pleased with, but it had nothing to do with the plot, um, so it had to go. Um, which is a shame, because it explained it really well. <laughs> an appendix might be the answer. Yeah, <laughs> footnotes everywhere. Um, but one of the interesting things when, um, when Dave Walk, who's here tonight, um, who was our uh, scientific advisor, came in and, and spoke to the actors, um, he, he came and spoke uh, during one of our workshops and then when we started rehearsing the play as well, so with different actors, and both sets of actors got so excited and they fed off his enthusiasm for the subject. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see that in the yeah. performance now when they're talking about the, the maths and the science. It's the enthusiasm that carries it. And, um, and uh, yes, it's, I think that's one of the most important mm -hmm. things in... in, in using mm. art to communicate science is that you've got to grab the enthusiasm. Mm. Mm. Can, can, I, can I Please. plunge in and say something that's going to make this, these walls shake, the Royal <laughs> Society, which is that you can take completely the opposite approach and say a work of art is autonomous, it's got no obligation to any kind of scientific truth, it's its own thing entirely. And it's also not in the service of science, it's not a handmaiden to the science. Mm. And there's Lo there are loads of theatre makers and, and playwrights who really do feel there's actually a problem with the approach of um, almost a kind of public engagement idea that the, the theatre is there to convey. Mm. <coughs> well, immediately you're in that role of <coughs> lecturing, and so it yeah. gets into people's motivation for going to the theatre, which is yeah. they're hoping they're not going to be taught, but rather they're going to experience something. So and in fact, away yes, the whole idea of um, a creative misprision between the art and the mm. science is really the key for a lot of playwrights. Is It's letting something else happen, and it might not be accurate, and it might not be scientifically right, but it's its own work of art. It's a new thing that's come out of it. John? Yeah, I think the main <coughs> tension I <coughs> often perceive is not so much between scientists and um, uh, playwrights or produced in theatre, but it's between historians of science mm. <coughs> and people in theatre who have a much more critical view and are much more alarmed at the idea that some very influential play or film will define what people think 
uh, about about that story in an irreversible way. You know, you once the mm. cat's out of the bag, mm. you can't get back in. Um, mm. I actually quite like a <clears throat> a type of virtual historical uh, approach that you know is uh, is not so rigorously tied to science. I ha had another idea for a play which I developed a little, but then uh, we didn't do it, and it, it was rather short, almost like a, a play of a uh, of a short story, in effect, where you, uh, with a science fiction aspect, where you brought Newton back to life, you know, by developments in uh, DNA uh, recombination technology and so forth. You take some hair from his um, uh, his uh, 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 the, the part that remains of his hair, uh, you know, at Woolasthorpe or something, with all the mercury and everything in it, and you're able to reconstitute him. And the world of science is excited by his reappearance. Um, and people are mm. queuing up to give him their great unsolved problems and to see how he's going to lead the world of science and mathematics again. And what <laughs> happens is that they discover all he's interested in is the theology and the alchemy. That's what was really important. And he wasn't terribly interested in the maths and the physics at all mm. when, he, mm. when he reappears. Um, well, that raises an, another th thought that it was sort of been in the discourse about um, theologies or belief systems. I should declare a domestic <coughs> interest, which is that my partner is the playwright Richard Bean, who wanted to join us this evening, and um, uh, but he's looking after our daughter, um, as all good playwrights should. And he um, and he wrote a play at the Royal Court. Uh, was produced at the Royal Court a few years ago called The Heretic, um, exploring whether it has become impossible. Uh, to suggest um, or, or, or to share data around climate science that doesn't um, agree with the majority view. Which, and the majority view is an interesting idea in science and the notion of being settled and so on. And in thinking about this talk, Richard was talking to me about the notion of heresy and why so many plays, I mean, again, Galileo, uh, that look at science, look at science alongside various kinds of religions. I don't know if you wanted to pick that up, that thought that I suppose it's to do with ambiguity, certainty, <coughs> uncertainty. Are we also talking about beliefs as opposed to knowledge or facts or things that we can grasp hold of? Is that why drama circles around science in this way, that we're intrigued by what we believe well, as opposed to what we know? I, I think one of the fun things about theatre is you can set up um, uh, <coughs> sort of experiments. <coughs> so you can start to explore um, uh, things which are dangerous. Mm. Um, and that's, the, the, I think, one of the powers of theatre. So, so I think that's exactly where you... Well, what is the impact if you start talking about these things? And, uh, and I think, for me, that's the thrill of, of the theatre, is in creating things which aren't um, out there, and it, it's, it's kind of safe environment yeah. to explore the dangerous. Yeah. Yes, although um, not always. But also, I mean, <laughs> that goes along with this uh, very dominant theme in science plays... For, for centuries, which is the Faustian theme, the mm. idea of transgressing in seeking greater knowledge and going over some boundary. And then, if you think of Dürrenmatt, the, the physicist, saying, can we simply unknow it? Can we just, can we just uh, bottle it up again? Mm. And it's that boundary and that seeking after more, and it's, it's, it is deeply religious in many ways, mm. um, but it's, it's very much a part of that history of science plays. It's a real theme, um, that idea that you can, you can just bring it back, and that's what is in your play as well. Yes, Do you I recognize think, that? Um, absolutely. I think there's um, one of the things when you're, um, when you're writing for a company like the Royal Shakespeare Company, <laughs> his name's in their title. It's kind of, <laughs> you can't get away from him. He's, he's there. And in that same way, when you, when you approach uh, <clears throat> writing a play about science, then you have the, the history of all the science plays mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. and. And Faustus is a, is a, is a great example that, that was very much kind of in the back of my uh, brain as I was writing it. And, and there are um, uh, elements in, in Duramat's The Physicist as well. You can't help but be influenced by mm -hmm. that um, in the sense that you know, theatre doesn't really do genre, but there's this kind of mini subgenre of science play. So you can't, you, you can't not have those, those thoughts. Um, as you as you come to write it, and certainly with the story of Oppenheimer, which is a story that has been told um, in in different forms, mm. in in, mm. in different ways, and um, there's been TV, there's been film, there's been um, comic books, there's been um, opera, and there have been um, 
There was a verbatim play um, uh, written in the 60s. It's, mm. there's, it, 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 it's a story that, that has been told many times. Um, and so you can't help but feel that. Mm. But also, why is it important to tell that story now? Yeah. And, um, and so I think when you go to see um, a, a play, particularly a science play, you, you feel the weight of Rex Galileo or certainly Michael Frames Copenhagen in my yeah. case, um, when, you're, when uh, you, you go to it. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's important <coughs> to kind of find why this story, why now? Mm. And I think, I think mm. we did that. I think we did do that. Mm. It's also a history play, of course, in Shakespearean genre. I'm sorry, John. There's an interesting sort of personal aspect of Oppenheimer which sort of came through in the play, that he, he was someone who was deeply interested in literature mm. uh, and theatre and poetry himself. Um, a couple of stories about that. Once one of the recurrent visitors at the Institute for Advanced Study after the war where um, Oppenheimer became the director um, was Dirac. And Dirac once asked Oppenheimer, uh, what would you have done had you not been a physicist? And Oppenheimer said immediately, I would have been a poet. And Dirac said he found this incomprehensible because you know, what the physicist does is to take you know, the unknowable and incomprehensible and make it understandable. And what the poet does is exactly the opposite. <laughs> But Oppenheimer you know, pioneered bringing people from the humanities to the mm. Institute for Advanced mm. Study, and one of the first to come was T.S. Eliot, uh, who wrote the play The Cocktail Party while he was during that, that stay at the mm. Institute for Advanced mm. Study with mm. lots of interaction with Oppenheimer. And you know, people used to say for long periods of time, Eliot's office was the only one where there wasn't a single mark on the blackboard. But then one day, suddenly, alphas and betas and gammas started to appear on the blackboard and all sorts of arrows and diagrams, and people were very, very mystified. It's just that he called his characters alpha, beta, and gamma. He thought this was, this was right in this environment, with lots of diagrams as how they're going to move around in the scenes. But people like Girdle were greatly perplexed by seeing this new blackboard scenario. Oh, brilliant. What a, what a brilliant way to conclude this bit of the discussion because it's high time that we ask you some questions. But I wonder if what that captures is um, something I've wondered for a while, particularly working with Tom on this play, which is that we enjoy these moments where we put science on stage because we don't find enough opportunities as artists and scientists to talk with one another and to, and to, and to share our thinking about the world. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a little bit nervous about what you might ask us, but please put your hands up if you have got a question. For anyone on the panel, a hand right at the back can't quite see. Yeah, I'm oh, very good, sir. We can hear you. <coughs> You'll regret that. <laughs> I will just say this if you could keep your questions brief, we will be able to hear lots more questions. Thank you, sir. Okay, it's uh, Richard um, uh, from South London. Um, it says here since communicating science, is obviously the province of history, English, drama, and languages. How will or could any of this be included in any of our obscene, rule-based, and obsessment-obsessed national curriculum? Thank you very much. That's a very that's an excellent question. I, I I'm going to take a leaf out of so I'm going to take a leaf out of Marx's book here. And I'm going to ask for two or three questions, and then the panel will address two or three at a time. So another question, please, from somebody else. Hands in the air. Yes. Gentleman there, thank you. Thank you. Um, as well as conveying science and explaining science and sharing science, is there a role for drama in criticising science? <laughs> Brilliant question. Thank you very much. Is there a role for drama in criticising science? And one more? Yes, sir. Is there, so this is aimed at the playwrights, I guess, but, but everybody can have a, have a turn. Uh, is there a particular area of science, a topic, an issue that you would like to see a play about yourself, uh, that you would like to see about science? Very good. So in any order, ladies and gentlemen, Marcus. Oh, I'm going to go for that first question. Terrific. Good man. Great question, because um, I think one of the problems about, you know, why are we even having a sort of, you know, 
this is so exciting, getting some scientists <coughs> and some drama people mm. together. It's, it, it's a, really a product of our um, silo mentality yeah. in our education yeah. system, that, um, uh, which you know, goes right through to university as well. Yeah. Um, and actually, one of the projects that I did with Complicite was um, that we did some workshops for teachers um, exploring the, the connections between mathematics and theatre. Um, and uh, we advertised these workshops. Now, all the drama teachers in school know Complicite will just sign up for any um, workshop that they'll do. Yeah. Um, but we made it a condition that every drama teacher had to bring a maths teacher with them. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and it was very interesting because many of them said, this is the first time I've ever talked to the maths teacher in the common room. <laughs> um, uh, and then they just begged, you know, please come on. And, and it was kind of intriguing. When we did this workshop with these teachers, um, you could tell the drama teachers, um, they were all doing this at the beginning. Uh, and all the mathematicians are going to go. Uh, but by the end, it was quite hard to tell. And, um, uh, and the, the workshop actually, they went back and they, they, I'd heard a lot of stories. And we're actually developing on Thursday. I'm working, going back to Complicity. We're going to try and extend this because we think it's a fantastic way to actually sort of break down this silo mentality and explore ways of telling stories. I and mean, mathematics is everywhere. And, 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 uh, but our education system doesn't show that. No, I couldn't agree more. And uh, our experience, or you'd imagine the Royal Shakespeare Company work extensively uh, with English teachers, with drama teachers, but actually where we see greatest impact is where the school shares what we do on Shakespeare, the sense of getting people to stand up and, and own his words and to play, as you were describing before in your work with Complicity, it affects everything. <laughs> I mean, it's so obvious, and I'm sure it's obvious to everyone in this room, that creativity is part of everything that we do and that playfulness and curiosity. And it's so much part of being a scientist as Absolutely. well, which is what people don't understand. That's no. why this book for me, I mean, uh, Graham Greene described this book, Mathematician's Apology, as the greatest description of being a creative artist after the diaries of Henry James. And people just don't yeah. realise no. that being a scientist, you have to have leaps yeah. of imagination, creativity, and, and, and actually that's why a dialogue with the arts can help the scientists as well to, to really open up um, that sort of part of you. Which brings us rather uh, neatly to the second question. I would like to talk about whether there's a place in, in yeah. drama or the arts. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, it's not so much criticism of science, but it's showing science how to do certain things much better. Uh, certainly engaging with people and being memorable and having an impression upon people. I mean, I found Luca Ronconi more impressive as a creative person than any scientist I've encountered, much more impressive, uh, because the rapidity of his ideas, the diversity and unexpected nature of his ideas, and the speed with which they could be implemented. And, you know, like an experimentalist, building equipment, getting the show on the road at unimaginable speed for <laughs> what would normally happen in a university, you know, in the science department. So there are lots of things to learn. Uh, and also, I think uh, many actors, as we've said, and directors, they're very interesting examples of almost blank canvases. You know, you throw this new idea at them and you don't know what they're going to do mm. with it. Mm. You know, whereas if you talk to some graduate students about some, you know exactly what they're going to do with it, or you want them to do with it, uh, at least mm. at first. So, you know, there is an unexpected rebound of people who have a completely different perspective, um, you know, and they're not going to see it quite as you see it. So, so I think it's not so much that they're critiquing science, but they can really add to the way that it's expounded, the way that it's expressed, uh, in ways that no scientist typically uh, would be able to do. Guess I would say one of the things, I don't know if this is answering anyone's question, but it, it's come up, and, and that is one of the things that's common to <coughs> science and theatre is the importance of the process, mm. that you don't just plunk down a solution or a proof. You've got to go through a sometimes arduous process to arrive at it and, and fail. Um, and if anything, theatre tries things out, fails, fail again, fail better, as Beckett said, and you've You've got to go through that. And actually, many theater practitioners uh, like that more than the end result. Um, the emphasis is actually on the process. And one of them I quoted uh, earlier in working in France, actually, uh, Jean-Francois Perret puts up the different um, versions of this script as it's emerging on his uh, theater company's website so that you can follow. And there isn't a sort of finished, uh, perfect script that you can then refer to. You, you consult each stage of the process. And also the workshopping that you talked about is part of that, and he lays all that bare as well. So um, you think about cinema, I don't want to be sort of going down the route of comparing the genres too much or the media, but 
you see those, those credits at the end of movies and you think, wow, that's just such an incredible process they must have gone through, but none of it is laid there, except if you have the outtakes, you know, the, the mistakes that are made, and you laugh. But in the theater, it's so important to have that ex exposed in many, um, in many cases, and that would work really well in answer to the first question, I think, in terms of students getting involved in, I mean, why do they have to be given a science play? Why can't they do science and theater in a kind of workshopping process mm. that might teach them a lot more, actually. Tom, you, your response, I'd, I'd love to, what subjects should we immediately write about, <laughs> obviously, right. but to buy you even more time, do you think there's a place or a need or an interest in critiquing science and scientists through drama? Um, well, I'll start with the first bit first. Um, the, if we're just talking about um, uh, Science, scientists, scientists whose life I think would make good yeah. drama. Yeah. Um, I, when I pitched the eight play play cycle, I did have in my head a Paul Dirac play and a Lisa Meitner play and a Madame Wu play and a Schrodinger play and a, a Klaus Fuchs play. He's and, pitching now. <laughs> and there was also um, Oppenheimer Part Two, which was all Part Two. Yeah, which is set in the fifties about the politics <clears> of the hydrogen bomb. I also think there's. Um, what um, in the way that the Turing film, for all its um, faults, what it has done is bring that character to um, to a whole new uh, audience who, mm -hmm. who were not mm -hmm. aware of him and his work, and hopefully some of them will have gone back and, and um, found uh, more out about him. Mm. Um, I, I'd love to see uh, more about Ada Lovelace and mm. Charles Babbage, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's, there's, there are so many different kind of stories mm. that haven't been told or haven't found a way to be told yet. Mm. Um, and uh, the second one about whether um, theatre or art can criticise science, um, that's, uh, that's trickier for me. I think you can kind of, um, it's hard to, um, it's hard to criticise things that you don't know anything about. Mm. And mm. Um, I think if there's any criticism in, um, in my play Oppenheimer about the way um, the, the science was, um, was handled, was put together, and that came out of my learning about it. So it's uh, more difficult to kind of say this scientist, it's yeah. scientific idea I can want to um, criticise. I'd rather go and find out because it interests me first and then I will find some criticism for it later. This strikes me as a beautiful moment in your play where it's not so much a criticism of either the scientist or a scientist, but almost the edge of the usefulness of science. So Bob Serber's speech when he's uh, explaining <coughs> his data collection in Japan after, <coughs> after the bomb. Mm. And there's a moment where he can't continue uh, explaining the data, although the data is compelling and uh, proves something that otherwise could not have been proved. He, 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 run, he runs out of words, which is always interesting on stage, mm. uh, but then helps us with what's in his mind by using an image, a, 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 a ghastly image, but a poetic image mm. to help us with how he feels. So I found that was a very interesting moment because it feels not so much a critique of um, science or scientists, but of humanity remembering to use the right vocabulary at the right moment. That'd be fair. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Marcus, what, would you, what subjects would you like to see on stage, scientific subjects demonstrated on stage or <laughs> explored? Um. Oh, you've got one, great. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 uh, well, I'm, my area of expertise is symmetry. Um, and I think the breaking of symmetry and the symmetry. And there's also just a wonderful character there, which is Everest Galois, who was a young yes. revolutionary yeah. who died in a duel at the age of 20 over love and politics, yeah. yet had all, had created a new language to be able to navigate this world and, and, and take it out of the, the, the geometric to a linguistic. Um, so I think that there's, um, uh, uh, I mean, there have been a lot of novels um, yeah. written with that character. He's such a great character. But I think, again, you know, the challenge there is not to get too obsessed with that amazing story of this young revolutionary uh, and, the, and that period in Paris, it's to find a way to, to explore the world of symmetry mm -hmm. inside there. I, I loved your description of the stage, because of course in Stratford we have two stages that are on a thrust, so with the audience on three sides of the stage, and actually the possibilities for exploring mathematics are much greater yeah. than I'd understood. Yeah. John, your example. Yes, I mean, following on from Turing and that world, I mean, there's a more immediate, contemporary, deep ethical issue around mathematics 
and it's about encryption and snooping and spying. I mean, it's all mm. the people who followed on from Turing, you know, work at GCHQ and the National Security Agency in the US. Um, you know, so there are mathematicians are, are, are the people that grab your internet communications and, and so forth, and, uh, uh, and there's all this fuss about. So there's a big ethical question mm. there about whether you do that, you know, how do the people involved in it feel about it? How do outsiders feel about it? Uh, it's much more of a contemporary issue than Turing. Um, mm. So that would be mm, more yeah. exciting and impactful than another film about Turing. <laughs> um, you know, and each one he does more and more and more and everybody else does less and less. So, so I think there are some interesting contemporary issues, even for mathematics, not, not just science and climate change mm, is the one that your mm, husband mm, mm. worked on, so heretic, all mm, about mm. university environment yes. and trying to, you know, evaluate evidence. Mm. And that whole issue of just evaluating evidence, so where you've got... You've got the dramatic court scenario, you know, you've got mm -hmm. people mm. in the law, you've got people in politics, you've got the public and, and so on. So, you know, there's lots of scope in, mm. in many of these issues. Yeah. We saw Alec Jeffries on the telly a few weeks ago, you know, with the DNA mm. um, uh, 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 work, you know, that led to the solving of this murder for the first time. Um, so there are many, many interactions mm. between science and the sort of dramatic yeah. world, and some of them with, with new ethical questions that yes. people seem very reluctant mm. to explore. Mm. It, you, you touch on something we haven't, we haven't mentioned earlier, which is um, this, when we think about these in, intriguing <coughs> scientists, the temptation to think of them as, as working alone, these mm. sort of extraordinary, singular... Uh, genius figures, as opposed to really trying to represent and explore the notion of team and collaboration yes. and the management of people towards an idea. And yeah, very good. I, I, I'm keen. Sorry, Chris. Of course. Just no, just please to do a quick answer to what subject was, what was the question about which subject? I mean, have you seen a play about the origins of the internet? Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that really affects all of us globally, pretty much. And Never seen, mm. I've never seen. I've never seen a, anyone talk about yeah, it in brilliant. terms of a yeah. play material. So how would you do it? Yeah. But there are some things that would really um, present a challenge there. So mm, <laughs> sure. I don't know. Yeah. But it's a great, you know, it's a great story. Yeah. Um, just one more thing, and that is, it's so hard to separate the science. I mean, the issue of are there plays that criticize science? Invariably, they become plays that criticize the manipulation of the science, mm. and that's just. Right through, I've been jotting down title after title of plays that, that do this. That it's it's it becomes what happens when it goes into the hands of yeah. Yeah. Um, what do we do with it? Powers. Yeah, thank you. A couple more questions. I'll take two or three again. Yes, gentlemen there. Um, hello. This is a question about um, interfacing uh, science plays with uh, politics, with morality. Um, you'd, I mean, we'd like to think that we've come a long way away from. Uh, the the Cold War and the real politic, real politic and the course of politics taking place at that time, and you would have imagined that um, science plays couldn't be used to defend the indefensible. Uh, how, what what do you think that <coughs> science playwrights can do um, so that science in um, used in plays can't be used to defend the indefensible? Um, I could use examples such as, say, sending animals to space, um, testing on twins, um, things like that. So how can science not be misused? Thank you. Great question. How can science not be misused? Yes, sir. Um, how do you feel about the difference between nice, rational, secular playwrights, right, taking poetic license? How do you feel about the difference between nice, rational, secular playwrights taking poetic license with science versus um, playwrights writing about pseudoscience and representing it as real? Mm, very good. Thank you. A related question. Pseudoscience. Thank you. There was a question. If somebody had their hand at the back, yes. Thank you. Uh, just a question for anyone who knows. Uh, I, I, I agree. Um, I don't particularly want to see another play about uh, Alan Turing. But, uh, and, and he's very popular because of the, because of the very human story of, uh, of having to hide his sexuality. Uh, 
the story of Tommy Flowers seems to have been given slightly short shrift. Has anyone dealt with that, and or has anyone got plans to? Because in, in his own quiet way, that's possibly a more interesting story from a human point of view, and from the point of view that he was, he created a computer from his work in a post office exchange. So, uh, I mean, I think there's potential application, there's potential productions that you can make in a, in a dance space, for example, relating mm. to that. Yeah. Can I just ask you to add a sentence or two for people who might not know who he is? Oh, I, right, terribly sorry. Um, Great, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, Tom, uh, Tommy Flowers worked on, uh, uh, he was one of the um, people who worked on the, the computer that uh, implemented the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the cracking of the code. Uh, and he, he created a computer that doesn't exist called Colossus. Uh, so his life's work and his own money went into the creation of uh, Colossus, which then got uh, suppressed by the government and the Official Secrets Act. And this was another man who had to make a great sacrifice for the war by, by having an invention which could have benefited the whole world locked up in a basement somewhere. Brilliant. So Thank very you. Uh, exciting story. Terrific. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take that one first. John, would you like to answer that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good example. I mean, the, the, the Turing effect, you know, that people then get this idea that there was just this one person who did everything. Um, and Flowers is a great example, you know, of the sort of technical, young technical wizard who's actually fabricating uh, this fantastic machine, which actually works first time and then goes through almost his whole life with nobody knowing that he invented the first computer till very late in the day, and then eventually this was recognised and you know, he was fated by the right audiences. He died, I think, just two or three years ago. After the war, Churchill rewarded him by putting him in charge of, in effect, the whole technology of the post office, you know, that the post office had to move to automated switchboards, uh, and it was Flowers that, who was given the job, really, of, of overseeing doing that. His son told a rather touching story that I heard a couple of years ago. So, you know, while it was still secret of all that he had done, inventing the first computer, I think he was probably about his late 70s or 80 at the time, he decided to enrol in an evening class, you know, somewhere over in East London, you know, thought that he ought to learn how to use a personal computer. So he went to this little evening class, you know, and had it pointed out, you know, this is the keyboard and so on, you know. And he did the course, you know, and he got his 100% and he went home and put it on the board and I suspect took his computer apart and then immediately improved its performance rather <laughs> dramatically. But his son said, you know, he restrained himself from telling the instructor, yes, I, I invented this. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Watch this space. Yes. <laughs> Kirsten, can I come to you on this question of whether we, we could misuse science in the theatre? Well, the, I mean, the one that really mm -hmm. springs to mind is uh, there have been two plays about Fritz Haber. And uh, I think, I hope I have this right, but the same science that generated fertilizer, fertilizer. then yeah. became used to make mustard gas, right? And so... Um, this has fascinated playwrights enough to generate two plays. But I guess the bigger question is, why contain, I mean, why should something be off limits if, if actually it could be more dangerous not to talk about it? I mean, it's, I'm not sure what exactly you're thinking of if you're thinking of dangerous uses that could come out of a play now that could help terrorists develop new weapons or something. I mean, that is a very serious issue. Um, but the general principle which is so common to so many science plays of not limiting knowledge or you know, needing mm. knowledge to be allowed to live and, allowed, and not putting limits on it. That, that's sort of a basic starting point for a lot of science mm. plays. Mm. Um, so so uh, that's just a couple, those are things that come to mind. I, I suppose my experience, and I'd be interested in Tom's perspective, is that actually playwrights take those sorts of responsibilities very seriously. Mm. And, and if they fail to, their audience will find them out yes. <laughs> and not, not give it... So it's one of the, the big things about writing a play about um, a physicist. You get a lot of physicists in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there was no way that I could get away with, with making stuff up. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah, we, we, I, we spent a, a very alarming Saturday with an, an entire audience of physicists. It was wonderful with the collaboration of the Institute of Physicists. It yeah. was a little bit frightening. That it was, we, fine, it was fine. We got through it. They, they basically kind of said, yes, you're, you're OK. <laughs> um, I, I think when you are presenting um, science as real on stage, mm. and this is one of the... You take artistic license when you're, when you're telling a, a true life story. Um, you have to because what you present on stage can never, ever compare to the complexity and contradiction of life. Mm. That's why we have theatre, to help us make sense of it and, and find patterns and put things in order. Um, but it was very important to me that the science was right, even if the, the biography had to condense time or, or merge yeah. characters and um, those sort of things. Um, and. Um, Mostly, not just because of the the um, the reason that there would be physicists coming and, and that would kind of um, piss everyone off. Um, it's the fact that if you're if you start um, presenting science as true that isn't true, yeah. then you're writing science fiction. Yes. And I wasn't writing science fiction; I was writing science in fiction, which yeah. is um, a, a very uh, thin line between yeah. the two. But it's an important distinction, I yeah, think. Absolutely. And, and I'm afraid this is going to be our last question, having checked in the time. But Marcus, I'd love to know, do you think in relation to this question about pseudoscience that there is a, there's a real risk there about people misrepresenting science? It's slightly different to... I think the, the risk, and I've seen it in various kind of uh, plays and workshops I've done, is, is when people use the science as a kind of a mask. Um, so they'll say this is a play about quantum physics, and 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 they won't try to, but that's meant to wow the audience, and then yes. everyone sort of goes. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the danger: not to use uh, the science as somehow um, uh, um, a veil uh, to to kind of say, okay, well, you're not going to understand this, but it's really deep. And uh, I think that that's a kind of fear for me. I've seen that happen, yes. yeah. um, and uh, and I think that can be a danger. Yeah, not pretending we're cleverer than we are. Marvellous. Yeah. Marvellous. Well, what an extraordinary discussion. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to share the stage with the four of you. It seems to me that we've decided that we can change the current government's mind about the relationship between creativity and science, which is excellent, and that there are quite a lot of plays that Tom's got to write in a hurry, and a, f <laughs> and a few more that a few other people ought to write, and some absolute forgotten heroes of science, and some good words of caution. So, um, a terrific evening. Can I thank very much uh, my guests on the panel, Marcus, Tom, John and Kirsten. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>